Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David. And welcome to the listeners around the world to episode 189. This is how to crush negative thoughts using all or nothing thinking. Not using all or nothing thinking, how to crush <laughs> negative thoughts containing all or nothing thinking, yes, which is oh one God. of the most common oh of human distortions, and we're going to about to show you how to, how to crush it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, my, I need therapy after this. <laughs> this is the uh, second episode in our series called The Cognitive Distortion uh, Starter Kit. And we're going to be focusing on some of the best techniques for each of the 10 distortions. And today we'll be talking about um, all, or, all or nothing thinking. That's where you look at things in black and white categories w without shades of gray. You, you, you're thinking either you're a complete failure or a uh, total, total success would be... Uh, an extreme and common example of all or nothing thinking. And it's one of the most important of all the cognitive distortions. And it it leads to many, many problems. I've listed some of them here. But I, I'm saying this uh, distortion is at the heart of perfectionism because all, perfectionism... What? what? Cho, you, go ahead. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay, I think I did something wrong there. But no, no, you uh, didn't do anything wrong. Okay, but... perfectionism, all, all or nothing thinking. <laughs> sorry. You think you're either uh, perfect or, or, or a failure. It's at the heart of depression. I've often thought that it might be impossible to be depressed without all or nothing thinking. It's certainly a huge component in performance anxiety. You, you, you tell yourself you have to hit it out of the park or you're going to uh, screw up completely, whether it's athletic performance or public speaking or uh, t taking an examination or, or whatever. It's, it's huge in, in public, uh, public speaking anxiety. Uh, you know, you, you might think uh, if, if somebody asks me a question I don't know the answer to, I'll, it will ruin my presentation completely and, and everyone will lose respect for me. Like they're either going to worship me or, or hate me. It's it's really also also whoops. Uh, well, the phone is ringing. We'll just just ignore it. I should have unplugged it. It's also a key to shyness, and I can't remember why. Uh, so Rhonda will now tell us. <laughs> <laughs> because of maybe the person who is shy is thinking no one will ever like me. I'm not good enough. No one will ever want to talk to me. Yeah. No one yeah. will respond to me. Yeah. Right. People will judge me. They'll look down on me. They'll think I'm a loser. Everyone, everywhere, in all parts of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, that would be overgeneralization more than all or nothing. We'll do that in the next oh, okay. In the next podcast. But maybe we'll remember what's all or nothing about shyness. But it's, it's also the key to relapse prevention training. And all or nothing thinking can actually cause people to commit suicide. As an example I'll give you in a minute. Mm -hmm. But when we do relapse prevention training, you see the problem people get into when they recover from depression, if they have these profound uh, recoveries that I've been experiencing lately, uh, they go from severe depression to kind of a euphoric state. And so they go from the nothing of all or nothing thinking, which, which is I'm, a, I'm a, a loser. I'm a complete loser. I'm a complete failure. I'm completely hopeless. And then they recover and they say, oh, no, I'm a winner. I'm going to be happy for, forever. All, all my problems have been, have been solved. And it feels so great to, to, to think that way. But it sets you up for relapse because no one is entitled to be happy all the time. 
And the way I think about it, and I've said this many times on podcasts, is everyone is entitled to five happy days per week and two miserable days. And if you don't have your five happy days, you're, you need a tune-up. And if you don't have your two miserable days, you're getting too happy and we're going to have to put you on lithium. But that's a thinking in shades of gray thing. And I, I tell all of my patients when they recover, you have to accept the fact that you are going to relapse. It's not if you're going to relapse, it's, it's when. And it'll happen soon. And if you tell yourself this is okay, it's okay to be upset sometimes. You have a fight with your wife or your husband, you, you get depressed again, you get upset. You say, okay, well, th these are going to be my two miserable days, but I've got some tools I can use and, and work my way out of this. That's what relapse prevention training is. Yeah, that's the beauty of teen therapy, I think. Yeah, but if you haven't done relapse prevention training, then the patient will go from the into the all of all or nothing thinking. And I can remember a patient of uh, one of my colleagues, Matt May. I, I met him the day he recovered after 50 years of misery. And, and I told him, now we've got to do relapse prevention training because you are going to relapse. And he says, no, I'm not. I refuse to do it. He refused to do relapse prevention? Yeah, he was so into the all or, of all or nothing thinking, he said he, it would be impossible for him to, to relapse. And then sure enough, he fell really hard, uh, had a really bad relapse. He, he came out for an intensive mm -hmm. with Matt mm -hmm. all, all the way cross country. Wow. And then he had to come back for another lengthy intensive because it was so devastating to him. Whereas if he had accepted thinking in shades of gray, mm -hmm that he's human, like, like the rest of us, and, and you don't go into never-ending euphoria. Right, because life, life happens, and things happen that you have no control over. A a absolutely. But uh, all or nothing thinking is the cause of hopelessness. I'm completely hopeless. See, my moods are either wonderful or terrible. And since they're not wonderful, they must, they must be terrible. You can't have hopelessness without all or nothing thinking because in reality, all of, all of your emotions change, change constantly. But if, you tell your, but if you're into all or nothing thinking, you'll discount improvement because you'll say, oh, well, I'm still somewhat depressed, so I, it doesn't count. I haven't, I haven't gotten anywhere. So if people make incremental improvements, they'll discount them because they're yeah. not like all yeah. Yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, the motivation is important with every distortion. And in the introductory podcast we had uh, just before, before this one, I emphasized you've got to do positive uh, re reframing and see if you really want to give up the negative thought that has the all or nothing thinking or the perfectionistic thought. And there's a lot of advantages to, to all or nothing thinking and to, to perfectionism. You know, it may motivate you to work hard and when you achieve something, you'll feel, you'll feel euphoric and, and, and the all or nothing makes things much more dramatic. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I was doing my research, I was into all or nothing thinking. Half the time I think this research is gonna, is mind blowing, it's so fantastic. And then the next, and I go high, you know, it's like going down the roller coaster. And then the, the, the next day, I, I think, oh, my gosh, this isn't going to work. I'm screwed up. The research is no good. And then I go into a, you know, feeling really down and depressed. And it was constant up and up and down. It was the same way with my clinical practice. When I, I was into perfectionism and all or nothing thinking, and, and when patients were getting better, I would say, oh, I'm going to be the greatest therapist in the world. This is so fantastic. And then when patients were telling me, Dr. Burns, you're not helping me, I couldn't stand it. Because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm failing, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a failure, that, that type of thing. Um, Gee, that sounds it, hard to go from one extreme to the other. It seems so draining. Yeah, but, but, but it's, it's rewarding too, because when you think you're going to get to that all, you know, it, it just makes you feel so happy that I'm going to become so fantastic and so successful and, 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 and that type of thing. Um, the... Uh, We've got some examples, and then I want to give a really great vignette of, of a patient. But uh, if you've read my book, Feeling Good, you've probably read about the physician who was uh, on one of these 400 calorie a day a day diets, and uh, she was losing weight. She was studying for her licensure exam, and then one night after dinner, she opened the freezer and saw this 
half a gallon of her favorite ice cream and said, oh, I'll just have one little teaspoonful, which she did, which of course she'd been starving herself for 10 days on this diet and it tasted so good. But then she told herself, I've blown my diet completely. That's all or nothing thinking. The thought made, made her so guilty she ate the entire half gallon of ice cream. Yeah. Now, I think you've got a good example of all or nothing thinking that you've got. Oh, in. yeah. I, have, I worked with a young woman um, when she was an undergraduate who uh, you know, was studying to go into a, um, a, sci a science and she had to take anatomy and physiology. Oh. And she was really worried about failing the final. And she had the negative thought that um, my future is going to be taken away from me because I'm going to fail the final. Oh, yeah. And, and she also thought, you know, if I don't... And, but why, for okay, just a moment, okay, why yeah. is that all or nothing thinking? That's a great call. Um, my future is going to be taken away from me and I'm going to flunk the final exam. Because she only saw one future. She only saw that she's going to flunk the exam and there's lots of, you know, she could have gotten a B or she could have gotten a C. There's lots of different, well, even if yeah. she did flunk that particular exam, you know, maybe she could, have, could take it over again, or maybe she could, you know, use that to think perhaps she'd go into a different field. Yeah. Or there's a lot of varieties right. that she still had options for in her life. Yeah, right. Dr. Beck uh, treated a college student who came to him. He'd been one of these straight-A superstars and captain of the football team and Mr. You know, beautiful, wonderful, wonder boy. Yeah. And he got a lot of uh, excitement out of that. And then he uh, he got a bad grade on a exam at college. And I think he got his first B or his first C. And and he was suicidal. Oh. And telling himself, I, you know, I'm a failure as a human being. And then Doctor Beck, who had he had a really uh, a really charming way of, of teaching and doing therapy and and he says well you should thank your lucky stars you screwed up on that test uh and it's also well, why should i i was planning to commit suicide what why why what's so great about the fact that i screwed up on this test and he says well now you can discover that the world doesn't come to an end when you when you fail or screw up on something yeah that's great isn't that neat yeah well uh, here's actually this is what she said about why it was all or nothing thinking she said because um, I'm looking at it as if I'm only going to do very, very well, or I'll fail, and there's nothing in between. So right. That was her reasoning why it was all or nothing thinking. Right. Beautiful. And then what's her second negative thought? I'm letting my parents down. And you say that's also an example of all or nothing thinking, and I agree, but t tell us why. Well, because um, it's as if her parents, she thinks that her parents' entire view of her is based on this one test. And that, and also based on her achievements, and based on her achievements in school, and that if she doesn't do well in this particular test in this particular field, you know, her parents will never see anything good about her. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And what what's the best technique? Now we don't want to get mechanistic and say there's one technique that's going to work for this distortion and another technique for another distortion, but we do want to give you a technique or two to recommend for each of the 10 distortions. And what's the one that we're recommending for all or nothing thinking, or well, one, one to consider? Well, the technique of shades of gray. Yeah, that, that looking at things in shades of gray, be, because that's the way the world is. Nothing in the world is, is all or nothing thinking. Now, I, what do you think about my office? Is it perfectly well organized or perfectly horrible? <laughs> no, it's it's a really beautiful office, but it's not perfectly well organized. But you've always been able to find everything you need, even if it just takes a minute or two. Yeah, it's actually kind of cleaned up compared to what it was before you came by. I was oh. straightening and filing for about a half an hour. Oh. But I mean, if you look at the closet there, there's all those pieces of paper with that app we were going to create mapped out, and we're not going to create that particular app, but they're all over, you know, hanging on the closet doors, and, and I got all, an old computer here in the corner, and, and a lot of junk junk all over the place, and, you know, you couldn't to say it's the most beautiful organized office in the world, you can't say it's it's the worst one, it's, it's somewhere in between. Right. And when you're living with all or nothing thinking, you're, you're, you're living with a view of reality that doesn't fit the re reality. 
Um, the, There's a lot of pressure on you, don't you think? Like if you if you wanted your office to be in the all, you know, yeah. all perfect, all organized, it would take forever, and it would be, and it would take it would take a lot of your time, emotional energy, yeah. you know, your th your cognitive energy, and you wouldn't have time to do. And this is the other same things. on on being being productive. I, I love to write. We're doing podcasts. We we didn't have to prepare that much for this podcast. I, I had a lot of things I wanted to say and I had taken so, some notes on that. But if, if, if we had to get it perfect, we, we'd be waiting years before we recorded the, the, this podcast. And I've found personally that as I've lowered my standards and stopped putting so much pressure on myself, I get way more creative and, and have uh, way more fun. I'm going to tell you about the most challenging patient I, I was confronted with early in my career when I was just learning cognitive therapy. And again, I apologize if I've told this story. I've told it once before somewhere fairly recently or part of it. I can't remember where, but it's a great, it's a great story. A, a, we got a call at, at the University of Pennsylvania from, from an attorney who said that his daughter had been hospitalized involuntarily for, for many years. And she was now uh, 18 years old and was you know, the equivalent of, I guess, a senior in high school. But she hadn't been to any high school because she'd been in this mental hospital and that she was taking classes in the mental hospital with, with, with tutoring with, from tutors. And these were the days when people were put in mental hospitals often for many years. I guess they had the idea that they'd have some psychoanalytic treatment that takes years and it wasn't un unusual. But she was just fulminantly suicidal and she would uh, try to find a light bulb to break and then she'd slash her mm -hmm. flesh mm -hmm. uh, and, and was, was very uh, pretty, pretty wild. And uh, the, the, treat the treatments ha had been pretty much unsuccessful and and he her father had heard about cog what was then the new cognitive therapy this was in probably mid 1970s and said could he take her to Penn to have a consult to to see if maybe cognitive therapy would would help and there were only a few cognitive therapists in the world so dr beck asked if you know i'd be willing to see her and so we set up the consult and her her father came in and introduced himself, introduced me to his daughter, we'll call her Emily. It's not her real name, but we'll call her Emily. And uh, so he left and then I, I, she, she said she was very depressed and, and wanted to commit suicide. And I, I, I said, well, what, what's the thought that, that's making you suicidal? And she said, well, I'm a, a lazy human being and, and, and I deserve to die. And now she came from a family of high achievers and, and what, what she meant by I'm lazy was she had misinterpreted the symptoms of depression for laziness. A lot, loss of motivation is a symptom of, of, of depression. But, but because she was measuring her worthwhileness by achievements and she came from a family of high achievers, she was saying, I haven't even been to a regular high school and, and I've accomplished nothing, and so, so I'm, I'm a worthless human being, and it's just a perfect example of all or nothing thinking. And so I did a little role playing with her, and she was very uh, powerful. And I was trying to, you know, show her that the, the, this thought really, really isn't, isn't correct. And we did, I said, imagine two attorneys are arguing your case in court, and one, one attorney you can be the prosecuting attorney and you try to convince the jury that uh, Emily deserves to die. And she said, well, uh, the prosecuting attorney says that uh, Emily is a lazy human being, so she, she deserves the death penalty. And, and, and so then I said, well, the defense attorney, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, w would ask what, what percentage of human beings in the United States are uh, lazy. She said, 30%. So I said, so are, are you saying then that 30% of human beings in the United States should be put to death? And then she kind of stopped her. And then she says, well, but, 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 but still, she deserves to die, though, because of her laziness. And then I said, well, the defense points out that uh, laziness is a symptom of depression. 
uh, loss of motivation and, 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 and you can call it laziness or you can call it a loss of motivation, but all depressed people feel that way. And in the United States, we don't treat people with, with a death penalty because they have an illness like, like clinical depression. Instead, we give them new effective uh, treatments. And we went back and forth a few times and we only had like 40 minutes. Uh, and I didn't know if I was getting anywhere, and, and, but it was time for her father to come back in. And, and he said, well, what do you think about this uh, young doctor? Do you think you'd want to be transferred from New York to Philadelphia to one of the hospitals here so you could work with him? And of course she said yes. Yeah, and she <laughs> said, I think I would, and my heart sunk. I know. And be, especially because her father was a malpractice attorney. Mm -hmm. And he specialized in suing mental hospitals and psychiatrists. Oh. And so I was, so that's nerve -wracking. I was fearful and I had no hospital privileges. And he made an arrangement with the president of a local hospital to hospitalize her. It was a psychoanalytic hospital in Philadelphia that since has gone bankrupt, but it was uh, quite active at the time. And, and they said that I, I couldn't treat her in the, ho in the hospital because I didn't have hospital privileges but I could go and visit her twice a week and we could go behind the hospital where there was a, a baseball stadium and we could sit on the barracks and I could uh, you know, do cognitive therapy with her. And so we worked like that. And after she'd been in the hospital three or four weeks, uh, this is a long story, but it's a, it's, it's a good one. I apologize, I'm elderly and I tend to babble. Uh, I, when I was younger, I babbled also. It's, it's due to narcissism and not elderliness. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but you're I, a good storyteller. Yeah, and I love I love stories, and they have messages yeah. embedded that, that can be very healing. But at any rate, uh, you know, we we would do battle back and forth, and ex, you know, externalization of voices. It's kind right. of an adversarial technique, and and it was very dramatic. And I could tell that she was a real powerhouse. Yeah, and. Uh, and, and I said, you, you know, Emily, you're, you're kind of wasting money here and time being, being in this hospital. And it was summer then, the beginning. And I said, other kids your ages are, you know, they're, they're getting ready to go to college. And, and maybe you could take a, a couple courses here at, uh, we had a very fine Ivy League university there in Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, you take a couple of summer school classes. She says, oh, Dr. Burns, you're such an ass. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm so stupid. I couldn't, I haven't been to high school yet. How could I compete at the college level? And I said, well, you're always so negative and predicting negative things. And, and, and what, why, why don't you t t take a chance? And, you know, you could get an apartment for way less than $2,500, $3,000 a day. Your dad's paying for this, meant for this psychoanalytic hospital. Wow. And and you could you know be take a couple of classes. So she was very reluctant, and she was uh, took these two courses. I don't remember what in, and she kept complaining. Oh, Doctor Burns, why don't you admit it? I that I, I I know I'm flunking these classes. And then at the end, I said, How how did you do? And she she said, Well, it was just what I told you. I just I didn't learn anything. I flunked both classes. And and I said, Well, can I see your your report card? She says, well, I don't have to show it to you. And, and I, I said, well, if you want me to believe, you know, what you're saying, you've got to show me your report card. So she showed it to me and she had an A plus in both classes. Wow. Hmm. And I said, why, why did you tell me you failed when, when you got an A plus? And she said, well, I, I probably fooled the teacher or something like that. And, you know, it's all or nothing thinking. Right. And I didn't learn everything as good as I, I, I should have. And, and she was always in a, in a all or nothing thinking. Yeah, it was her, her, her trap. And, and then I said, you, you know, Emily, uh, the, the, the semester, the new freshmen are, are gonna register in about two weeks from now. Why, why don't you just go to the dean's office and, and tell them that you wanna uh, apply for this week's class? You, you know this story, yeah, right? right. And well, where did I tell it? I don't know. It's a maybe you've told it at an intensive, or maybe you've told it. Oh, the podcast. intensive that yeah. could have been. That's yeah. that's where. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Know, maybe it wasn't on a podcast, but uh, and she said, "Oh, Doctor Burns, you're so stupid. How 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 would they let me in to uh, a top Ivy League school?" But uh, wait, the interesting thing is, she's committed to all or nothing thinking. Yeah, very 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 committed, and that's that's why you've got to do your uh, positive reframing with any distortion. Just maybe you don't 
want to give up your all or nothing yeah. thinking. That, that's the key. But I didn't have the, the this uh, paradoxical agenda setting stuff in those days. It's so much easier to treat people now that we have these anti-resistance, uh, resistance busting techniques. But I didn't have them then. And, and so, uh, she said they, they closed out registrations last spring. And how could I get into a top Ivy League uh, college, university, when I haven't even been to high school? And I said, well, uh, sometimes life, life is crazy. Why don't you go and uh, uh, j just go and, 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 and tell them that, that uh, Dr. Burns told you that you're supposed to register and be admitted to the freshman class. And, and if they have any questions, just tell them to call me. Because I knew that she was a powerhouse. Because yeah. she, you know, she beat me up all the time in the role play exercises, yeah. and she probably inherited a super brain from from her dad. And she said, "Oh, Dr. Richard, you're you're just crazy, but I'll I'll do it." And then I got a call the next day from the dean of students, and and he said, "We had this unusual event this morning. A young woman came in and said she's a chronic men mental patient." And, and that she hasn't been to high school yet, and that somehow you said we're supposed to admit her to the university of blah, blah, blah. And it, it just, it sounds crazy. What, what's, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> and then I said, well, I know it is crazy, but um, uh, I, I think you should take a chance on her because, she, you know, she's, she's a sleeper and, you know, I, I think she'll, she'll blow your mind. Mm -hmm. And and he and he said, well, and I said, and I'll I'll continue to follow her and and, and support her. And then and then he said, but she'd have to take the SAT exam. We can't let anyone in without the SAT exam. And 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 and, and, and he said, but it is it's actually going to be given tomorrow. Wow. And I can arrange for her to to be able to take it tomorrow, and I can get her scores ahead of time. Uh, but I have to tell you, if her scores aren't aren't real high, I can't admit her. Yeah, because that school had standards. Very high standards. Very high standards. Everyone fights to get in, and right. most cannot get in. Yep. And uh, so I said that that's fine. And then he called two days later, and said she she's the highest scoring student in the United States. Wow. And and we're going to take a take a flyer on it. Wow. And so she, she got in, but then she kept up her crusade, Dr. Burns, you're, you're, you're so stupid. Uh, you, you, you don't bl believe what I'm telling you. I can't compete at, at this high powered Ivy League college. And then she came to me three weeks later, she just, or six weeks later, she took her first midterm with uh, a very famous professor who, who was world, world renowned. She took his, his class and and she said, uh, it was my first test and, and I flunked it. And I said, how do you know you flunked it? And she said, well, there were 100 questions and I got 17 questions wrong. I realized it after the test. I thought about the test and, and, I, and I realized that. And so I'm going to commit suicide tonight. Aww. And I said, well, why don't you hang, hold off until you get your Blue Book exam? And then you bring it into the next session and we'll, 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 we'll look at it together. So she came back, you know, a week later, and she had her blue book exam. She said, "Well, it, I was right. I, I flunked the exam, and I, I, I did miss seventeen questions. So I, I'm going to commit suicide." And I said, "Well, can I look at your blue book so I see what Professor So and So wrote wrote on it?" And she's again, she didn't want to show it to me, and so she held it up. I just I grabbed it. Wow. And I looked at it, and, and it said, uh, "Emily, you you missed 17 out of 100 questions. This is the highest grade on this exam in the history of our university. Wow! Um, I, I want to invite you to to work in our laboratory, you know, as a student. Yep. And I want you to major in psychology. Wow! And then and then put A plus. Wow! And uh, and you know she worked in this lab and. Uh, contributed to the development of one of the most used research tools of that era wow. in cognitive therapy research and uh, eventually graduated for first in her class and then went on to Harvard Medical School. Wow. But that was just uh, an example of, you know, the, the all or nothing 
thinking and, and of course the depression that she had struggled with before she finally began turning things around was, was unbelievably intense, intense and, and severe. Um, and wow, so, you gave her back her life. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I've often said I, I just wish I could pick up a phone and call her and say, do you remember me? And oh, I'm sure What she was does. your life like? And, yeah. you know, it would be just like a miracle to... Maybe she'll hear the podcast yeah, and that would remember be fun. me. Maybe and, she knows your name and she's looked. She's yeah, Googled I'm you. Yeah, I'm sure she'd remember my name. Oh, but yeah, anyway, that's all or nothing thinking. And uh, well, well, are we done with this podcast? Because I'd love to end with um, some uh, testimonials that you've gotten. Yeah, that, that that sounds that sounds great. So the two things to remember if you're if you have a thought with all or nothing thinking. Thinking in shades of gray is just one of many techniques that can help you. You've got to do positive reframing. Maybe what are the advantages of perfectionism? How will it help you? What does it show about you that's positive and awesome? And maybe this isn't isn't something that that you want to want to give up. Uh, but if you do are willing to to let go of this, and for me it was hard because I was into all or nothing thinking, and somehow I just thought. You know, if I keep trying to be the best, fantastic things will, will happen. And it helped me in many ways. I mean, yeah, it can be motivating. But the day I gave it up, uh, it just, it was, it was life changing. And, and then one patient said, you're not helping me. I was able to say, you're, you're right. And I'm sad about that. I really care about you. And yet I haven't been working with you in a way that's helpful. Let, let's talk about it. And then suddenly things opened up with these patients and I discovered that I became more productive. Uh, that's how I wrote Feeling Good. All or Nothing Thinking practically made me, I had such intense writer's block, I couldn't write the book after I got the contract because, wow. because my editor was saying, oh, David, you could, this must be number one bestseller. Wow, it's going to be fantastic. Just go home and rewrite the whole thing because your draft is crappy, so turn it into a number one bestseller. <laughs> just, yeah, so there is an external pressure too with all or nothing ex thinking. Ex exactly, and I sat at my desk and 10 days I couldn't write a single sentence. And then I said, well, why am I frozen? And I said, well, I've got to write a bestseller or Maria will be disappointed, just like your, your student that you said right. that you were treating. And, and, and I don't know how to write a, a bestseller. And then when I finally wrote that down on a piece of paper and saw, wow, that's all or nothing thinking, and then I decided to tell myself, no, David, I don't have to write a bestseller. I don't know how to write a bestseller. But what I could do is just write a book talking to patients the same way I talk to patients. I'll just talk to the reader the same way. And that I can do, and that'll be helpful to some people. And I don't care how many it sells or doesn't sell. That's the worry of the publisher. Right. And, uh, and then my depression, my anxiety, my writer's block disappeared, and the book just came, came flowing, flowing out. Let, let's well, that, that's a really great story. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we did a podcast with Marilyn uh, that was posted September 29th, 23rd of 2019. It was episode 159, and this person is referring to that podcast. And it's from Jessica, and she wrote, Wow, what a powerful experience listening to Marilyn's podcast. I was crying and laughing along with Marilyn and so inspired. I felt the enlightenment the moment it happened for her. Marilyn has contributed significantly to my understanding of team therapy, but more than that, she has provided a beautiful lesson for all of us who struggle. I can't thank her enough for being so vulnerable. Please pass this on to me, on from me. Marilyn is a hero. It's so beautiful and, and I feel the same way. I, Marilyn has so many fans to to come on the podcast and talk about her metastatic cancer and her fear her fear of death and her concerns that she's not spiritual or religious enough and uh, and then to 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 allow us to turn our moods around completely in in a single session has been so remarkable and so many people love Marilyn and 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 the odd thing is she's become like a spiritual hero to many people and yet she she doesn't talk big fancy words oh i'm so deep i'm a guru all no. she talks about is her loss of faith and, and her disillusionment with and her of, struggles and her and her struggles and she's just very very real so thank you for that endorsement and, and again thank you 
Maryland for all that you've given to so many people. Now I feel like I'm an elderly, sentimental crank, so I will sh shut up. Well, Maryland, you know, Maryland, you know, I feel sentimental toward Maryland too. Yeah. Um, so this is from Mosen, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing his name right. And he writes, hello, dear Dr. Burns. I'm Mosen from Iran. I also live in Iran. I remember 20 years ago when I got depressed seriously and couldn't find any way to release. I found a translated version of your precious book, Feeling Good, in my hometown's public library. I borrowed it and started to study. As I was going further, I felt I was getting better. I read that book several times, and every time I read, I felt better. I'm writing to thank you for your book. Later, I read lots of, your book, lots of books from other authors to find the same inspiration as your book, but I didn't. At the time, it was the only book from you in our library. Now that I've grown older and have improved my English language, I've decided to drop some lines here, and I do appreciate your help. God bless you, Dr. Burns, and keep you healthy and happy all the time. Well, thank you, Moshe, and I really, I really appreciate it. You know, my book, Feeling Good, is published illegally in Iran. Oh, is it illegal? And, and yeah, I've never gotten a penny of, uh, of royalties, but now I got a lot of wealth from Iran. Yeah, that's So nice. thank you. You're my uh, royalties, uh, yeah. Moshe. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one last thing. Uh, I, we're not quite sure when these distortion podcasts will be published, but if you're looking for training as a mental health professional, go to my website, feelinggood.com, and there, there's a number of great trainings there that might interest you. Just go to my, my website and you'll find updates on workshops and, and locations and registration details and so forth. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, David. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donsel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.